Well, good evening, folks. It's uh, 7 p.m. Central Daylight Time in Fairfield Bay, Arkansas. Uh, welcome to tonight's class. Uh, it's great to be able to uh, uh, stream live again tonight as uh, Nita and I are uh, spending a few days here in the Ozark Mountains of Arkansas. And so uh, they have uh, streaming live. It seems to be working, so we'll pray that it works uh, throughout this hour and a half uh, time period that we are together. And so um, let me begin just with a, a couple comments. Uh, like I say, Nita and I will be here um, for oh, about 10 days from now. And we still have a little traveling to do uh, once our time here is, is spent. <clears throat> but anyway, <clears throat> it's a good opportunity for us to get together around the table of, table of the Word of God and continue our studies in the principles of spiritual growth. Uh, again, <clears throat> I am recording this, and the recording will be available on uh, YouTube uh, tomorrow. I'll uh, download the recording from WebEx and uh, get it uploaded to YouTube. Um, all of the lessons we've studied thus far uh, that go all the way back to uh, November um, as we begin to study these, uh, what I call the milk doctrines, the, the milk truths. Uh, Paul told the uh, Corinthians that in 1 Corinthians 3 that he was not able to speak to them as to spiritual men, but to men of flesh. Uh, he was not able to speak to them as to as to spiritually mature believers, yet they were believers, but they were still baby believers, men of flesh. They were they hadn't found the victory in the spiritual life and were still spending more time functioning in their flesh than they were as spiritual people. And so the doctrines that they needed and the doctrines that so many uh, Christians need when they get started in the Christian life through faith only and Christ only, uh, they start out as baby Christians, knowing absolutely nothing about the spiritual life. And so we've been studying these, what I call milk doctrines. This is lesson number eight, and I have a total of 10 lessons in this classification I call milk doctrines. So uh, we're in the midst of lesson eight, where we are studying uh, 18 principles of spiritual growth. And we've been in this, this is now lesson, I think, part five of this lesson, uh, lesson number eight. So that's that's four times an hour and 30 minutes that we've already spent studying these principles of spiritual growth, and that's just in lesson eight. Uh, so if you haven't been to YouTube on my YouTube channel, and the channel is the letters B H G M teacher, B-H-G-M, teacher. And if you'll go on YouTube and search for that uh, page, that channel, B-H-G-M, teacher, you will have access to all of these videos. And just just in lesson eight, uh, this is part five, so in the, in the first lessons, as we begin, we're, we're considering 18 principles of spiritual growth. And so in March, on March 5th, we studied faith, principle number one, and time, principle number two. Then on March 7th, we finished time and studied acceptance and purpose. Two more principles of spiritual growth. Then on March 12th, we studied preparation, complete in him, and appropriation. And then on March 14th, we studied identification, consecration, and self. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten of these 18 principles that we've studied thus far. Uh, it would take uh, this hour and a half if I were to go back and just do a brief review of each of those 10, we don't have time for that. So that's why I've put this up here for you. If you haven't 
if you weren't there to participate in the live teaching at the time we taught it, then I suggest you go back and uh, view and listen to those YouTube videos. You can always go to my Dropbox and get copies of the notes if you haven't done that. And if you haven't sent me your email address so that I can add you to my Dropbox, you don't have access to it. So if you want access to the Dropbox and my files, the Word files and the PowerPoint presentations, then please uh, send me your email and I'll make sure it's there. And then every time that I post something in the Dropbox, you will get a notification that I have put something new in the Dropbox and that email address, your email address will give you access to the Dropbox so you can download uh, any of the Word files or the PowerPoint presentations you wish to do. Okay, so rather than do a review of all that, may I just suggest you go back and uh, view those videos to catch up if you weren't with us in our study of these 10 principles thus far. So before we get, begin our study tonight, let me, uh, let's open with a word of prayer. I trust that as uh, you're waiting for the class to start, uh, you would have taken my suggestion and evaluated yourself, confess sin if necessary, uh, we know that that's our responsibility when it comes to the study of God's word. Uh, we shouldn't have to spend time reminding everyone every time that you need to uh, confess sin if necessary. It's our responsibility to prepare ourselves mentally and spiritually for the, the intake of the word of God so that the Holy Spirit, who is the teacher, will be free to teach us the truths that we must learn from the words that we study tonight. So I'm going to open with a brief word of prayer. I'll, I'll allow a few moments uh, for those of you who may have joined late and didn't get a chance to see the, the introductory slides and prepare your heart for the study of his word. So let's bow our heads and pray. Father, as your children, may we realize that uh, the only way we can be fed in our spiritual walk with you is through your word. Your word is food that nourishes the spiritual life. And without your word, our spiritual life does not get nourished. And as I've challenged people in the past, Regarding this time issue, you only give us 24 hours a day. And in that 24 hours, we not only need to care for this physical body, which takes about three hours a day, spread throughout the 24 hours, not counting eight hours of sleep, of course, but we also need to feed our spiritual body, our spiritual life. And that can only be done through the study of your word. So again, the challenge still goes out to everyone listening and everyone who may listen. Will you commit to God to feed your spiritual life as much as you feed and take care of this physical life? Nothing in this physical life goes into eternity. And all that goes into eternity with us is the word of God that we have stored in our soul. So, Father, we come tonight to gather around the table of your word to add to that truth that we already have in our soul. And I just thank you. I pray for blessing upon this time together. I pray for open hearts to those who will listen now uh, to the live uh, teaching and later on uh, to the face to the Facebook videos uh, or the, to the YouTube videos in the future. And we, I just pray all this to honor for your honor and glory. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, faith, time, acceptance, purpose, preparation, complete in him, appropriation, identification, consecration, and self. We've looked at these 10 principles, and basically the last thing we studied a few weeks ago when we closed out our study of self is this slide. Someone has rightly said there are many separated from the world Christians who are not separated from themselves, Christians. We are, we're, there's a lot of Christians out there who have managed somehow 
<clears throat> to free themselves from the from the bounds, the bindings of the world around us. Although, how many so-called Christians walk around with this in their face and can't get it out of their face? How many, how many have a strap around their wrist so the cell phone doesn't fall out of their hand? Well, that's your business. That's God's business between you and God. But there are many separated from the world Christians who are not separated from themselves Christians. And so tonight we begin the 11th principle of spiritual growth, self-denial. Self-denial. When a believer begins to discover something of the awful tyranny of the self-life or has been endlessly struggling against that tyranny, he becomes intensely concerned about the denial of self with the resultant freedom to rest and grow in Christ. Man has many ways of seeking to escape the slavery of self. God has only one way. Well, let's first investigate and consider some of these man-centered methods. So number one in man's ways of trying to, trying to deny self. First, mortification. Mortification. Man tries to mortify his flesh or his sinful nature, denying oneself certain things for a time. That's what mortification is. Denying oneself certain things for a time or even for all time. I, I look at this and here we are. We're, we're in what Christendom calls um, the, the, the period of Lent. Uh, those days, it started a couple weeks ago with Ash Wednesday. A few weeks ago. And those days now leading up to uh, what Christian, Christendom has called Holy Week, uh, Palm Sunday, um, Maundy Thursday, uh, Good Friday, Black Saturday, Easter Sunday. Right. Now I know I grew up. I grew up with all of that in my in my religious upbringing. And one of the things I remember about this period of time is certain people, and I suppose I even participated years and years ago in my early uh, so-called uh, religious Christian religious life, denying oneself certain things for a period of time or even for all time is not even close. Mortification is not even close to the answer since the old nature will adjust and thrive under any conditions. Isn't that amazing? You start to limit, take away something from your physical body. Coffee, for example. How many years do we do we need that caffeine, that first coffee hit? But you know what? Even in my past, I have spent years with decaf. I, I, I took caffeine away from my physical body and my sin nature, my old nature, just learned to thrive without it. And the same, same thing is trying to get victory over our flesh. It is not even close. Mortification, not even close. Anything short of death to self. A.W. Tozer said these words regarding mortification. Quote, there have been those who have thought that to get themselves out of the way, it was necessary to withdraw from society. So they denied all natural human relationships and went into the desert or the mountain or the hermit's cell to fast and labor and struggle to mortify the flesh. While their motive was good, it is impossible to commend, to commend their method. For it is not scriptural to believe that the old Adam nature can be conquered in that manner. It yields to nothing less. The old Adam nature yields to nothing less than the death of the cross. A.W. Tozer, 
ends his comment with this sentence. It is altogether too tough to be killed. The old Adam nature is what he's talking about. It's altogether too tough to be killed by abusing the body or starving the affections. End quote, A.W. Tozer. So mortification is one of man's ways. A second of man's ways is called conquest. Conquest, probably the most drawn out and exhausting effort of all is the believer's struggle to conquer and control the rebel self. More meetings, more Bible study, more prayer are, are all resorted to, but neither are these, neither of these answer are God's answers to this problem. Neither. More meetings? No. Nope. More Bible study? No. Nope. More prayer? Nah. None of these are God's answer to this problem. Third, training. Another of man's ways to, to try to deny self. Training, here's a favorite that has been tried and found wanting down through the ages. Good Christian training and culture in the right homes, churches, and schools have been relied on to subdue the old nature and bring it into line. But it isn't amazing. Training doesn't work either. Again, it's man's way. Man's way. Let's, let's send these kids to... to some Bible school somewhere. Let's send them to seminary. Get their old sin nature under control by training. Four, another of man's ways. Number four, revivalism. Another failure has been the practice of, of holding special meetings once or, or twice a year. Call in some high-powered speaker, and some outside leadership, a stranger to the individual problems in a, in a local gathering. And if, if, if any of you have grown up and, and probably have participated in some of these in the past, let's hold a, a tent revival and bring in some high-powered evangelist or high-powered speaker who has no idea of what's going on in this local gathering, involves outside leadership, a stranger to the individual problems, and the devastating revival routine, confession, new resolutions new commitment, etc., in the hope that something will change. But it rarely does. Is there some change? Possibly. It might even be some people get saved for all eternity. But it doesn't really change their life. And if there is a change, it's usually not for very long. Mortification, training, conquest, revivalism. Here's a fifth, growth growth. So many dear Christians just keep plodding or racing through the, the deadening routine of their multitudinous church activities and duties, expecting that in time, self will change for the better as they grow. Someone somehow told them that the more involved they are in church activities, sing in the choir, feed the poor, let's go to the street on Friday and pass out uh, flyers and so on and so forth, that somehow that's going to bring about spiritual growth. But self never changes into anything but more of the same. As John writes in John 3, 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. Sometimes this self is entirely bad. as when it is angry, spiteful, unkind unjust, untruthful, unloving, malicious. In other cases, a good exterior conceals an evil heart. When we are proud of our humility, conceited about our Christian service, boastful of our orthodoxy, over forwardness and obvious conceit at the sound of one's own voice spoils many a prayer meeting. Well, there's five, but there's more. Number six, cleansing. 
up to the moment, confession and consequent cleansing have also constituted a popular method. However, 1 John 1, 9 has to do with sins already committed and not with the source from which they emanate. Do we need to deal with the sins we commit after salvation? Of course we do. But 1 John 1, 9 is, is that action that we must take because we failed. You see, if we can learn how not to fail, see, that's the idea. That's the idea. If we can learn how not to fail, then we won't have to use the means by what, that God has given us to recover from failure. Because that's what 1 John 1 9 is really all about. You've already failed. Now you need to confess that failure to get reestablished in, in fellowship with God. Watchman Nee said this, quote, the blood can wash away my sins, but it cannot wash away my old man. The old man needs the cross to crucify me, the sinner. Our sins are dealt with by the blood that's the spiritual death of Christ on the cross, where he paid for every sin, past, present, and future, for every human being, dead, living, and who will live. So our sins are dealt with by the spiritual death of Christ on the cross, the blood, Watchman D says. But we ourselves are dealt with by the cross. And what else happened on that cross? Our old man was crucified with Christ on that cross. Our old man. The blood, the spiritual death of Christ, procures our pardon. The physical death of Christ and the burial, the final result of the cross, procures our deliverance from what we are we must recognize that we have been crucified. Our old man was crucified with Christ on the cross. Cleansing doesn't get it. First John 1, 9 deals with the sin that we've committed, but First John 1, 9 has nothing to do with the source of that sin. So we got mortification, training, conquest, cleansing, growth, revivalism. Here's a seventh experience. Today, one of the prevalent attempts by something for something better is to go in for, quote unquote, the baptism of the spirit, speaking in tongues, and so on. Experiences. This is by far the most dangerous and pathetic trap of all, as it is simply self given over to neurotic, religious, emotional, out of control functioning. The most dangerous and pathetic trap of all, as it's simply self, it is simply self neurotically and religiously rampant and out of control. Every attempt by man to improve self ends in failure. Every attempt. I don't know how many you, you who are listening, may have been involved in some of these, but I can tell you in my 72 years and actually 30 years since I truly became born again, and even before that in my religious religious activities, I'll bet I've participated in just about everything in this list in an effort to fix my old self. Every attempt ends in failure. Calvary precedes Pentecost. Let's remember that. Calvary 
what took place at Calvary precedes what took place at Pentecost. Death with Christ precedes the fullness of the Spirit. Power, yes, God's children need power, but God does not give power to the old creation, nor does he give power to the uncrucified soul. Satan will give power to the old Adam. Oh, yes. Satan will give power to that old self, but not God. Which of us does not know something of the failure of our ways? Well-intentioned as they may be. What most do not know is that this very failure is the path to learning and entering into God's way. And we say that again. What most do not know is that this very failure that we, that we keep running into, failure after failure, this very failure is the path to learning and entering into God's way of dealing with self. Isaiah writes in Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. So, we ask the question, what is God's way of self-denial? He has but one, only one way. And it is on the basis of all his other ways, the principle of the finished work. The principle of the finished work. His way for us is everything. In everything is the way. His way for us in everything is the way he has already traveled. He, Jesus Christ, has already traveled conquered and completed everything. Christ is the way. So the cross is God's way. It was on the cross of Calvary that God, in Christ, dealt fully and finally with self, the nature from which all our sins flow. The Amplified Version of Romans 6.6 reads this way. We know that our old, unrenewed self was nailed to the cross with him in order that our body, which is the instrument of sin, might be made ineffective and inactive to evil, for evil, that we might no longer be the slaves of sin. Romans 6, 6. The reason there is no other way for self to be denied is that God has done the work in this way. Our identification with Christ Jesus in his death and resurrection. Romans 6, 3 to 5. We are identified with his death, with his burial, and with his resurrection all God's work. And we as believers, the moment we place our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, this becomes true in our lives. At that very instant, we are identified with Christ Jesus in his death and resurrection. It is done. Now, it is ours to believe. It is done. But do you believe it? The flesh will only yield to the cross, G. Watt said. Not to all the resolutions you may make at a conference. Not to any self-effort. Not to any attempted self-crucifixion. The flesh will only yield to co-crucifixion, crucified together with Christ. 
my verse, my verse that opened my eyes to what Christ did for me and what God provided for me in Christ. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. Watt continues, it is not by putting yourself to death, but by taking through faith and surrender your place of union with Christ in his death. That is the blessed barrier of safety between you and all the attractions of the flesh. And that makes the way open to do the will of God. The cross of Calvary resulted in the deaths, plural, of the Lord Jesus, both for sin, that was his spiritual death, the penalty, paid the penalty for all sin, as well as to sin. That's his physical death, burial, and resurrection. In that he died to sin, he died out of the realm of sin, and he arose into the realm of newness of life. Romans 6 4. Eternal life. And our identification with him on Calvary took us into death, down into the tomb, and up into newness of life. We are identified with Christ. Our old man was crucified with him. God sees our old man dead, buried in the tomb, and our old man didn't come out of that tomb. However, we rose out of that tomb to newness of life, just as Christ defeated death. Too often our problem is we want to run back into that tomb and see if we can't find our old self and bring him back to life. First, Romans 6.3, baptized into his death. Then comes Romans 6.4, buried with him. Then we have Romans 6.5, for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. And we also have Colossians 3.3, 3, for you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Therefore, Romans 6.11, we are to reckon, consider, reckon you also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. But reckon yourself also to be alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Praise the Lord, it all happened at Calvary. Our sins were paid for, our sinfulness was dealt with, and both by the ultimate death. And we receive the benefits of the work of the cross simply by reckoning on or believing in the finished work of the cross. First, through the word, we find out what God did about our problem. Then, as we become thoroughly convinced of the fact and begin to understand it clearly, we are able to agree to reckon it to be true. And as we exercise faith in God's fact, we begin to receive the benefits of that finished work in experience. Was it not true in the matter of our justification? Yes. And we will likewise find it to be true in the matter of our emancipation from the slavery of the self-life. Andrew Murray wrote the following, quote, 
the powerful effect of the cross with God in heaven, in the blotting out of guilt and our renewed union with God, is inseparable from the other effect. That other effect, the breaking down of the authority of sin over man by the crucifixion of self. Therefore, Scripture teaches us that the cross not only works out a disposition or desire to make such a sacrifice, but it really bestows the power to do so and completes the work. This appears with wonderful clarity in Galatians. In one place, the cross is spoken of as the reconciliation for guilt, Galatians 3.13. Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Murray goes on, but there are three more places where the cross is even more plainly spoken of as the victory over the power of sin, as the power to hold in the place of death the eye of the self-life, of the flesh. That's the outworking of self and of the world. Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Another one, Galatians 5.24. Now, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And Galatians 6, 14. But may it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. In these passages, Arthur Murray closes. In these passages, our union, that's our identification with Christ, the crucified one, and the conformity to him resulting from the union are represented as the results of the power exercised within us and upon us by the cross. As we learn to stand on the finished work of Calvary, the Holy Spirit will begin to faithfully and effectively apply that finished work of the cross to the self-life, thereby holding that self-life in its place of death, inactive, resulting in the not I, but Christ life, as we've already read in this lesson at least twice, Galatians 220. So when we are functioning in the new man, when we are functioning in the new man, that's when the Holy Spirit is able to hold that old self in the throes of death. But when we stop yielding to God the Holy Spirit, what do we do? When we quench the Holy Spirit, we simply allow that old self to come back to life and take over again. Because without yielding to God the Holy Spirit, that old self will continue to, to hassle us our entire life. That's why it's so critical that as we, as we grow as new Christians, we need to learn these truths. We need to take that baby Christian to the point of spiritual spiritual position and growth in their understanding of God's word so that they know how to activate, how to get into that new man so that they can find that power, that victory over the enslaving old self. But what happens? So many Christians are out there trying this, trying that, more Bible studies, more whatever. 
singing in the choir, go on this mission trip, do this, do that, trying all that stuff and not looking to God's way. And that is the cross and the work of Christ on the cross. So let's go to number 12. That's our next one in our lesson of these principles of spiritual growth, the cross. <clears throat> Take a deep breath. Studying these truths is hard work, right? This isn't something that you just uh, nibble at, though. Here's a nice little peanut here or whatever. This is work. This is work. Although spiritual hunger and need are prime requirements for light and understanding, the Holy Spirit does not release the treasures of the word quickly or easily. The Holy Spirit does not release the treasures of the word quickly or easily. Deep calleth unto deep. As the psalmist writes in 42.7, we have to be prepared. And even then, there is much time and digging and praying and meditation and yearning and experiencing all of these things involved in this spiritual journey from spiritual infancy to spiritual maturity. True spiritual maturity comes in no other way, but praise God and praise the Lord. It does come in this way. Understanding and appropriating the facts of the cross proves to be one of the most difficult and trying of all phases for the growing believer. Our Lord holds his most vital and best things in store for the growing believer, in store for those who mean business, for those who hunger and thirst for the very best as it is in our Lord Jesus Christ. The believer's understanding of the two aspects of Calvary gives the key to both spiritual growth and life-giving service. Calvary is the secret of it all. It is what he did there that counts. And what he did becomes a force in the life of a Christian when it is appropriated by faith. This is the starting point from which all godly living must take its rise. We shall never know the experience of Christ's victory in our lives until we are prepared to count, to reckon upon his victory at the cross as the secret of our personal victory today. There is no victory For us, which was not first his, Calvary is the secret of it all. No victory for us, which was not first his victory. What we are to experience, he purchased. And what he purchased for us, we ought to experience. Notice it says we ought to experience. Question. Are you experiencing it? Are you experiencing what he purchased for us? The beginning of the life of holiness is a faith in the crucified Savior which sees more than his substitutionary work. More than his substitutionary work. It is a faith which sees myself identified with Christ in his death and resurrection. Actually, our Father has trained every one of us for clear-cut, explicit faith in the second aspect of Calvary. And what is that? Our, our individual identification with the Lord Jesus 
in his death to sin and rising onto resurrection ground. This training taught us thoroughly in the first realm. And what was the first realm? Believing and appropriating the finished work of his dying for our sins. That was called, that's called justification. So now we are asked just as definitely to believe and appropriate the further aspect that we read in Romans 6, 6, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. And in Romans 6, 11, likewise reckon you also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God. Our intelligent faith standing on the facts of Calvary, gives the Holy Spirit freedom to bring that finished work into our daily lives. We stood on the fact of his dying for our sins, and this act of faith allowed the Holy Spirit to give us our freedom from the penalty of sin, justification. Now, once we come to see the fact of the further aspect, we are urged in the word to stand on the liberating truth of our dying with Christ in his death to sin, which allows the Holy Spirit to bring into our lives freedom from the power, the enslavement of sin, progressive sanctification. And of course, when we stand in him in glory, we will be forever free from the presence of sin glorification. Justification, freedom from the penalty of sin. Sanctification, freedom from the power of sin. Glorification, freedom from the presence of sin. As our substitute, he went to the cross alone, without us, to pay the penalty for our sins. As our representative, he took us with him to the cross. And there, in the sight of God, we all died together with Christ. We may be forgiven because he died in our stead. We may be delivered because he, we died with him. God's way of deliverance for us, a race of hopeless incurables, is to put us away in the cross of his son and then to make a new beginning by recreating us in union with him, the risen living one. As Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things pass away. Behold, new things have come. It is the Holy Spirit who will make these great facts real and true in our experience as we cooperate with him. And so the plague of our hearts will be stayed and we shall be transformed into the likeness of Christ. Through the crucifixion of the old man with Christ, the believer has been made dead unto sin. He has been completely freed from sin's power. He has been taken beyond sin's grip. The claim of sin upon him has been nullified. This is the flawless provision of God's grace but this accomplished fact can only become an actual reality in the believer's experience as faith lays hold upon it and enables him moment by moment, day by day, though temptation assail him, to reckon it true. As you, the believer, reckon the Holy Spirit makes real. As you, the believer, continues to reckon the Holy Spirit continues to make real. Sin need have no more power over the believer 
then he, the believer, grants it through unbelief. And really, that's it. If you don't, if you aren't experiencing this success, it's because you don't believe it can happen. Unbelief. If you are alive unto sin, it will be due largely to the fact that you have failed to reckon yourself dead unto sin. Quite honestly, if you have to confess sin, it's simply because you have not believed what we've talked about here and you are still alive unto sin instead of dead unto sin. The Reformation brought into focus once again the emphasis upon spiritual birth without which there can be no beginning. What is lacking amongst believers to this day is the proper emphasis on growth. Not just to be saved and heaven by and by. What sort of salvation would we have if our Father simply saved us from the penalty of our sins and then left us on our own to deal with the power of sin in our Christian life and walk. But most believers feel this is about as far as he went and are struggling to get on the best that they can with his help. How many do you, how many times do you hear that? I So often I, I get a request, help us pray, help me pray. We pray for God's help, but we're going to deal with that word help in a little bit too. Because this, this is the Galatian error, so prominent even now throughout born-again circles. And what is it? Paul writes in Galatians 1, 6, and 7, I'm amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a, for a different gospel which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. And Paul goes, goes on in Galatians 3, 1 to 3, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law? or by hearing with faith. Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? We must be brought back to two basics. Freed from the penalty of sin by his finished work. And to the to the Filipinos listening, so to go, by his blood, he has saved us. Freed from the power of sin, the power of sin by his finished work. Again, for my Cebuano speaking friend, Sagahum Giaoko, by his power. He has raised me. Paul writes in Galatians 3.24, Therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. In 2 Corinthians 5.7, For we walk, we walk by faith, not by sight. And Colossians 2.6, Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. We are not left to deal with the old life ourselves. That old life has been dealt with by Christ on the cross. This is the fact which must be known. Since on that fact is built the New Testament principle and doctrine of holiness. In other words, Calvary is as much the foundation of sanctification as of justification. 
Both gifts spring from the same work and are two aspects of the same salvation. Now, as long as the believer does not know this dual aspect of his salvation, the best he can do is seek to handle his sins via confession. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See, that's only necessary after the damage has been done. I pray that we won't need 1 John 1, 9. I pray for each one of you that, that you will understand these spiritual truths and you will come to the point where you recognize yourself in Christ and recognize what you, your need to yield to God the Holy Spirit to let the cross do what it will to our old sin nature. And we won't have to deal with failure. Is it possible? Absolutely. It has to be possible or God is a liar. You see, 1 John 1, 9 takes care of the penalty of the product. Personal sin, but not the source. The sin nature. Isn't it time we allowed the Holy Spirit to get at the source and cut off this stream of sins before they are even committed? Isn't this infinitely better than the wreckage caused by sin, even though it's confessed? So we confess and we go back on sin again. We confess, we go back on sin again. We don't have to do that. We don't have to go back out and sin again. When believers get sick and tired of spinning year after year, in a spiritual squirrel cage, sinning, confessing, but then sinning again, they will be ready for God's answer to the source of sin, which is death to self, brought forth from the completed work on the cross. God is in control of the circumstances of life, but you are in control of your volition. The circumstances of life are created by God to bring about need in your life. Self-centered or egocentric need leads to failure. Failure leads to hunger. Hunger leads to the cross Christ-centered, Christocentric. Failure in life is a plus for God's side. See that? Back up. Here, let's look at this now. God is in control of the circumstances of life, but you are in control of your volition. The circumstances of life are created by God, brought into your life by God to bring about need in your life. Now, if you center on yourself in satisfying that need, all you're going to do is fail. Well, that's okay. God says, okay, that's what you're going to do. You're going to try to solve your problem your way, but it's going to fail. And failure after failure after failure leads to hunger. There comes a point in your life, and I was 42. I was 42 when I looked back at my years of failure after failure after failure. Guess what? All that failure produced a hunger, and the hunger led me to the cross. Now, once I was led to the cross, and I began to understand the cross's purpose in my life, my life now became Christ-centered instead of self-centered. And that, my friends, is God's perfect plan. So failure in life is a plus for God's side. The idea is it should turn the one who continues to fail due to sin toward the only answer, and that's a life in Christ. 
when God's light first shines into our heart, our one cry is for forgiveness. For we realize that we were born separated from God, guided by our contempt, sinful nature, our corrupt sinful nature, living in sin. But once we have known forgiveness of sins, we make a new discovery. The discovery of sin and we realize that we have the nature of a sinner. There is an inward inclination to sin. Therefore, there is a power within that draws us to sin. And when that power breaks out, what happens? We commit sins. We may seek and receive forgiveness, but then we sin again. And life goes on in a vicious circle, sinning and being forgiven but then sinning again. We appreciate God's forgiveness, but we want something more than that. We want deliverance. We need forgiveness for what we have done, but we need deliverance from what we are. Our reckoning on the finished work of, the, of our death to sin in Christ at Calvary is God's one way of deliverance there is no other way because that is the way he did it we learn not to add to a finished work in the matter of justification and now we must learn not to add to the finished work of emancipation freedom from sin we will be freed when we enter his prepared freedom there is no other. The believer can never overcome the old man, even by the power of the new, apart from the death of Christ. And therefore, the death of Christ on the sin is indispensable. And unless the cross is made the basis upon which he overcomes the old man, he only drops into another form of morality. In other words, he is seeking by self-effort to overcome self. And the struggle is a hopeless one. Marcus Rainford refused to stop short of God's ultimate for freedom. As he writes, it is not to be a mere passing impression of the mind when we are undisturbed by active temptation. No mere happy frame of spirit when under temporary refreshing from the presence of the Lord. No self-flattering consciousness of a heart exercised in good works. From none of these is the believer to infer his practical mastery over sin. But on the ground that Christ died unto sin, and he, the believer, liveth unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Ian Thomas writes these words. I must recognize that the enemy within the camp, that's the flesh, the old nature, the self, the I, the old Adam, is a usurper, one who takes a position of power of importance illegally or by force. By faith, I must reckon him to be in the place that God put him, crucified with Christ, the flesh, our old nature. I must realize, he goes on, that now my life is hid with Christ in God, that he is my life. The cross. No other way. Well, now we come to the next principle, discipleship. So we're moving on, moving through these. Faith, time, acceptance, purpose, preparation, complete in him, appropriation, identification, consecration, self, self-denial tonight, the cross tonight, and now discipleship in our last 24 minutes or so. A disciple is one who first maintains the fellowship of the cross, which results in fellowship with his Lord 
discipleship. The reconciliation of the cross and the fellowship of the cross must be equally preached as the condition of true discipleship. Christ is the answer, but the cross is needed to clear the way for him. In spiritual progress, our Lord never pushes. Our Lord is a life, our Lord is our file leader. He never pushes. He's the leader. As the Hebrew author writes in 12.2, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, before the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Not only as our file leader, he leads us step by step. We struggle and we fail, self-effort, which sets up a yearning for the answer to his depressing, this depressing failure in our life. In time, we see the spiritual facts of deliverance in the cross, that's identification, and that in turn produces the required hunger to enter into that freedom, freedom for fellowship with the answer. And who's the answer? Our risen Lord Jesus. George Watts said, nothing can set us apart for God. Nothing can make us holy except as the cross is working in us because the cross alone can keep the hindrances to holiness in the place of death. J. E. Conant says this, back of all successful work, for the lost is an inward spiritual impulse. And back of the impulse is the Holy Spirit who reproduces Christ in us. And the brand mark of it all is the cross. The brand mark of it all is the cross. The living experience of which, that is the cross, must both enter and control the life before we are fit for service, end quote. Nowhere was our Lord Jesus more explicit and firm than when he mentioned discipleship in Luke 9, 23, and he said to them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And later in Luke 14, 27, and whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. His reason for this is simple. Self cannot and will not follow him. But taking up one's cross results in death to self, as we just saw in our study of the cross. Taking up one's cross results in death to self and newness of life in Christ Jesus. A disciple is one who is free from the old and free for the new. In other words, <coughs> scriptural words, death indeed unto sin, but alive unto God, Romans 6, 11. And for this, the Lord Jesus clearly states that each must take up his cross. Here is the ultimatum. So now to the how. We've said what you must do or must take place, but now let's get to the how. But first, let's talk about the how not to take up one's cross. Andrew Murray writes this, Christians need to understand that bearing the cross does not in the first place refer to the trials, which we call crosses but to the daily giving up of life, of dying to self, which must mark us as much as it did the Lord Jesus, which we need in times of prosperity almost more than adversity, and without which the fullness of the blessing of the cross cannot be disclosed to us. 
when we lose sight of our cross and his cross, may we cease to confuse the words, my cross with the cross. Sometimes believers in self-pity bemoan themselves and say, oh, I've taken or I must take up my cross and follow Jesus. But when we lose sight of our cross and his cross, his cross becomes our cross. His death, our death. His grave, our grave. His resurrection, our resurrection, and his risen life, our newness of life. No taking up of our cross does not mean the stoical or the unflinching, un under suffering or pain bearing of some heavy burden or some hardship or some illness some distasteful situation or relationship. Enduring anything of this nature is not bearing one's cross. Taking up the cross may or may not involve such things, but such things do not constitute our cross. The believer's cross is the cross of Calvary, the one on which he, the believer, was crucified with Christ. As we read already tonight several times, and let's read it again. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. There, the eternal emancipation proclamation was signed with the blood of the Lamb, the spiritual death of Christ on the cross and sealed by the Spirit of God. Every believer is thereby freed from all bondage, but not every believer is aware of this liberating truth. Sad to say, the only believers who are interested in freedom are those who have come to the place of hating instead of hugging their chains. It is true that the intellect is stumbled by the cross, yet the antagonism of the cross is mainly moral, both in the sinner and in the saint, for its message is only welcomed by those who desire freedom from the bondage of their sins and who hunger and thirst after the experiential righteousness of God. Yes, as Norman Doughty writes, the need must be intense. He writes the divine way, that is via the cross, for spiritual emancipation is just as offensive to the child of God as the divine way for salvation is to the lost. How many people refuse to accept Jesus Christ as the only means for salvation? Well, the numbers are Shocking, but let's take that now into the body of Christ. How many Christians, they are children of God, but they're, they, are, they are offensive. The spiritual emancipation is just as offensive to the child of God as the divine way for salvation is to the lost. When the believer begins to really see the cross for what it is, a place of death, he is inclined to hesitate about choosing such fellowship. Our Lord Jesus understands this well, but there is no other way, since that is the manner in which he finished the work on our behalf. So he simply allows our needs to continue their relentless pressure until we finally bend to his inevitable way of the cross. We will be ready to take up our cross when self becomes intolerable to us. 
when we begin to hate our life, as spoken of in, in Luke 14, 26, if anyone comes to me, Jesus said, and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. This deep burden of self and hunger to be like him caused the function of the cross, crucifixion, to become attractive. The long devastating years of abject bondage make freedom in the Lord Jesus priceless. The cost becomes as nothing to us. We begin to share, think of it, we begin to share the attitude of our Lord Jesus and of Paul and of the writer in Hebrews 12.2, for the joy that was set before him, the Lord Jesus endured the cross. That's the author of Hebrews. And Paul, here's his writing, but God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, Galatians 6, 14. Yes, we begin to glory in the cross, our very own freedom from all that enslaves us, from all that would keep us from fellowship with our risen Lord. So we begin to take up our cross, our liberation, our personal finished work held in trust for us, so long and patiently by the Holy Spirit. Whew. Talk about trust funds, huh? How long has the Holy Spirit been holding that in trust, holding this freedom and trust for you since you became a child of God? And here's how we take up and bear our cross. The how-to. Finally prepared by our needs, aware that our bondage was broken in Christ on Calvary, we definitely begin to rely on that finished work. We begin to rely on that finished work. We appropriate. Our attitude becomes, I gladly and willingly take by faith in the facts my finished work of emancipation that was established at Calvary. I reckon myself to be dead indeed to sin and alive to God in Christ. This is taking up one's cross. As we learn to do this, we begin to find these facts true in experience. The Holy Spirit brings that finished work of death and applies it to all of the old nature, which is thus held in the place of death, the death of Calvary. If and when we turn from the facts and begin to rely on anything or anyone else, ex including ourselves, self is released from the cross as active and enslaving as ever. Through this process, we are patiently taught to walk by faith, to maintain our attitude of reliance on the finished work of the cross. Adolf Saffer wrote, the narrow path concerning the cross. You have died with Christ, <clears throat> ending with the glory of the Lord Jesus <clears throat> is the path on which the Lord draws near and walks with his disciples. Christ liveth in me. The Lord within lives as the sole source of life. The old eye has no contribution he can make to Christian life and service. He can never be harnessed to the purposes of God. Death is the old, the decree, the decreed portion of the old eye. There cannot be two masters in our lives. If the old eye is in active possession of us, then Christ cannot be. But if we gladly take hold of the great fact of redemption, I have been crucified with Christ, then Christ by his spirit 
takes up the exercise of the function of life within us and leads us as his bond slaves, <clears throat> his disciples in the train of his triumph. Well, our next principle is the process of discipleship. There's one thing I noticed in this in my notes that I want to share, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna pull that up. I don't have it ready tonight to share it with you, so I'm gonna I'm gonna pull that up, and that'll be where we'll begin uh, our study on uh, Tuesday night. We will be here uh, again Tuesday night uh, here in Arkansas at uh, Fairfield Bay. And so I'll uh, be able to broadcast live again uh, this coming Tuesday night, and I'll pick up uh, with some more information regarding this idea of discipleship and uh, some of what we've talked about thus far. And then we'll pick up with this study of the process of discipleship. So we're going to quit a little bit early. We've got a little bit about seven, eight minutes left of the evening. Um, but uh, I want to thank you all for joining. And once again, um, this will be, uh, this has been recorded. And so we will uh, get this posted on YouTube tomorrow. Uh, and again, for, for all of you, I see we have uh, several who have joined us on uh, WebEx. I'm so glad to see uh, all of you. Um, and we got, we've got Butch DiPano and the LePon team, that's Roland Barrow, Nesta, Dadai, Roger and the Mokul, all from, uh, um, all from the Philippines. And so, uh, and I see Dr. Patel and Brian, good, great to see you. And for those of you who have joined on Facebook, I don't have my Facebook open here in front of me, so I don't know who all has been with us. But I thank you all for, for joining tonight. Um, Nita and I have uh, been gone the last few weeks, uh, spent some time in California with the daughters and grandkids, and, and now we're back here in Arkansas. We've got a few. We'll get down to see Dr. Patel and, and uh, Brian and others. And, um, so anyway, we'll be back again Tuesday night. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this time together. Um, may the truths, uh, these spiritual growth principles, uh, get into our hearts, and may may we um, become aware of of the importance of all of this in bringing us uh, to maturity, to bringing us to that point of of freedom from being slaves to our sin nature. Uh, yeah, we can't eradicate the sin nature. That'll never happen. But you have given us everything we need in your word and the indwelling Holy Spirit and our being identified with Jesus Christ, not only as he paid for our sins on the cross, but also as he died physically, went into the tomb and rose again in resurrection life. You identified all of us in Christ in those two aspects. And it's the, it's the resurrection, it's the death of the physical death of Christ that, that took our old man, crucified our old man, the old man of every believer, so that we can be free from the, from the evils of that old sin nature inside each one of us. And may we grasp the truths from your word in which we find victory over our old nature. We praise you for all these truths and praise you for this time together in your word. In Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, folks. Good night.